Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard, and if you are not already familiar, I'm building a reaction control system for model rockets. Sometimes this is referred to as RCS, or cold gas thrusters, but today this is an update video. So, about two months ago I posted a video with some very, very early progress on this system, and today we're gonna talk about what's new, what has changed, what has improved. Before we get into it here, I like to start most of my videos with a test, so let's take a look at this vehicle right here. Up top, there are six different thruster ports. Actually, that's not true. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thruster ports. So we can do positive and negative on yaw, pitch, and theoretically roll, although the gimbal mount that this is in only allows for two axis control. Eventually, we'll do some roll tests as well. But let's just demonstrate that the system actually works. We've got a bunch of valves in here. We have our uh, flight tank ready to go and a 4,500 PSI compressor. So we're gonna go ahead and pressurize the flight tank and just demonstrate that the system works before we get started here. The first step, as with everything, is always safety. So we're gonna put on some eye protection and start water cooling this compressor. You can't really hear it, but basically there's a pump in there with some ice water or some very cold water at least that is now circulating through one of the two stages within this compressor. And now we're going to start pressurizing the flight tank. I don't think my neighbors love this. All right, so our flight, excuse me, sir. Our flight tank is pressurized and we're ready to go here. We have about 3000 PSI in here. That gets regulated down to 800 and then to 150 PSI. And that is our working pressure on the rocket. But 150 PSI um, doesn't actually go into the rocket until I use the pressurization valve here. And you can hear it leaks quite a bit. So this is obviously not a good flight setup. It's not going to work for flight. I'm just using this for ground testing. So even big leaks like this are okay. So once we're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the computer, and after a couple of seconds, I'll press the vehicle for flight and we'll start the reaction control system. So here we go. Booting up the computer now. This is probably a good time to let you know that the controller for this is still very rudimentary, so don't expect anything crazy. So we're gonna press for flight now, and we're pressed. It really doesn't get old. Oh, and there it is. Now we're out of pressure. So the runtime. All right, easy there. You can hear the. Uh, you can hear the valves actuate. <laughs> okay. I just put some tape on the gimbal mount here um, so the vehicle doesn't like flail around while I'm talking, but let's get started. So why am I doing a reaction control system? I mentioned this in the last video that I did, um, but this is not for landing a rocket. It seems like it would be really well suited to dialing in the thrust for actually landing a motor, and it is, but certainly not at the scale that Echo is right now. The system is far too heavy. We're already up to about uh, one or 1.5 kilograms for all of the valves and everything included in the system. Frankly, this is just a super fun challenge. Um, I'm having a ton of fun learning all of these new concepts and um, trying to get all these new control laws to work. So while there's no direct use case, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm just having fun doing it. So a lot has changed since the last test, um, the most noticeable of which might be this tubing here, which is blue instead of white. Um, this is literally called blue tube. It's a rocket building material. Um, you can find it online and buy it, um, but it's, it's much higher strength than the cardboard thin wall tubes that I've been using. Um, it's about the same diameter, but it can take a pretty serious impact. This is the new flight tank. Um, it holds 13 cubic inches at 3000 PSI. It is perfectly capable of doing a full flight for a vehicle this size. I am gonna use Imperial units for this video. Sorry if you're into metric, I get it. But also all of this hardware is paintball stuff, which is usually specced around Imperial units. So I don't know, you have Google, you can convert this stuff. Anyway, 13 cubic inches at 3000 PSI. In theory, you could also use CO2 in that tank instead of compressed air. I think that would objectively be the better working fluid for this type of system, but it also costs more money because every time you test, you need more CO2. But with the compressed air, once you have the compressor, 
I mean, all of your working fluid is free and everywhere. After coming out of the flight tank at much higher pressures, it goes into the small 800 PSI regulator through a tiny little adapter and then into a 150 PSI regulator. Now this is a horrendously inefficient solution. Um, I have been learning a lot and I'm just sort of getting my feet wet here. So I've made a lot of interesting choices in terms of the purchases for regulators I have. However, I do have a better solution. This is a tiny little regulator that can go anywhere from 4,500 PSI down to 150 or so. So, um, so this is really the ideal solution. I'm just still waiting on the components to actually connect this to the tank to arrive. So that's not in use yet. Obviously we want to get rid of this nightmare. After coming out of the regulator at about 150 PSI, we go into the press valve. Uh, this is just the pressurization valve to turn on or off all of the pressure that we need to send to the rocket. Um, this is pretty simple. I think I mentioned this before, but we're just trying to minimize the number of leaks that we have. And um, especially while you're testing, like you're gonna have lots of leaks. So this press valve basically helps minimize that. After that, the pressurized air goes up into the rocket into a manifold that distributes all of the air to the different valves and the valves hold back the air and release it when it's time to actually turn a specific thruster port on like this, psh, psh, like that kind of thing. It's worth noting here that all of this stuff is subject to change. This is just an update video and not the final iteration of the system. Uh, we're just sort of developing as we go. Speaking of development, while we're on the ground, I can obviously use this 4,500 PSI compressor to actually pressurize the flight tank. But I don't know if you've ever been to like an open field, but there are usually not power outlets there. Um, so to solve this, basically I'm gonna get a um, larger scuba tank that we can use to fill the flight tank which has the added benefit of once you fill the scuba tank, which is just much more massive than the flight tank, you can go for multiple runs and multiple flights each day. Something else that needs to change before launch is this pressurization valve. So I mentioned earlier, the purpose of this valve while I'm actuating on the ground is basically to prevent the leaks that are in the rocket right now from draining too much pressure from the flight tank. Now, Obviously, the ideal situation here is to have no leaks. However, in the rocket, there are a ton of different connections between different tubings, different fittings, and things like that. So it's realistic to expect that I will have some amount of leaking even when the rocket is idling on the pad. So the solution for that has already been designed into the relay flight computer. Um, so this is the RCS computer, or basically the same one that's inside here. It's what's used to actuate all these different valves and fire a couple of pyro charges for parachute deployment things like that. Um, on this computer, there are outputs for plus and minus in the X, Y, and Z directions, um, but there's a tiny little extra one right up here, and that's an arming valve. The arming valve basically serves the same purpose as this pressurization valve, so here's how this all works. While the vehicle is idling on the pad, there's about 150 PSI of pressure against this arming valve, which is not actuated. Um, the arming valve, the output of it at least, goes into the manifold to connect to all of the other valves. Um, so all of those connections basically don't have the opportunity to leak on the pad. The only opportunity to leak is the connection between the 150 PSI regulator and the arming valve. There's one potential leak point while we're letting the rocket idle for anywhere between five minutes and maybe an hour. Then once relay detects that the vehicle has launched by looking at the accelerometer readings, this happens really fast by the way, it's about 10 milliseconds, um, it fires that arming valve which pressurizes all of the other valves and basically arms the reaction control system for flight. Speaking of valves, this is what the valve setup actually looks like. These are just regular old solenoid valves. Um, and actually, you can see two of them in the vehicle here. There are two screws right here and two screws right here. And those screws would go into something like this. Here's a photo of what the inside of the vehicle would look like with all of the full yaw, pitch, and roll valves installed. So these are just these cheap, like $10 Amazon valves. They are not special. They are not crazy. And here is where I will ask for some help. Right now, the trouble that I'm dealing with is that the mass flow rate on these valves is terrible. Basically, there's a very small orifice inside of these valves, uh, and it's about only two millimeters or so uh, wide, and that's what actually lets the air pass through the valve. So the mass flow rate, or the flow coefficient of these valves, sometimes labeled as CV, is basically pretty low. And that's something that you can expect from paying $10 a valve. Um, but even when you get into valves that are like several hundred dollars, I'm unable to find ones that give me a good enough mass flow rate while also maintaining a high pressure, something above 150 PSI. So what I'm asking now is if anyone is interested in doing some valve searching, um, please go for it. Um, I'm not super cheap about it. I'm willing to spend a little bit of money. And also if you're a valve company and you want to sponsor me, oh my gosh, I would totally accept it. Um, but 
I'm just looking for better valves right now. That's, that's basically it. So if you have any valves or suggestions for that, um, as always, the best way to get in touch with me is bps.space slash contact, and there's a link in the description below. These little guys can fly the rocket, like they will be okay. They're just not fully ideal. Like they'll be all right, but I, I do want better solutions. So anyway, yeah, the link is in the description down below. You know how this works. Now let's talk about controls. All of this stuff is done by the Relay Flight Computer. All of the flight software and hardware is done in-house. Um, it's all a common code base with the Signal Avionics system. So while Signal can't fly this stuff, um, all of these computers use basically the same set of sensors to keep things really efficient. Relay can control these valves really, really fast, certainly faster than the valves can actually actuate. Um, the actuation time in the last video looked to be about six milliseconds, which still seems to hold true. Here's a clip of uh, some super fast actuation on all the valves. Right now, kind of like the valve flow rate situation, the control software on the vehicle is not perfect. Um, what I've got running on here is a PID controller, which is both gated and saturation limited. So basically once the PID gets above a certain level, it just fires the valve. That is a really primitive controller for something as complex as reaction controls. Um, or at least cold gas thrusters. And so I will still have to move up to a more advanced controller. I think I think it could probably fly with this gated PID thing if I get it really tuned well. Um, but I'm working with a couple people on uh, implementing full state space control so the vehicle can actually look at not just the orientation, but also gyro rates, velocity, a couple other things to actually decide which thrusters to fire. Um, I want to talk about this a lot more, but I honestly am still learning myself. So I'm like brushing up on all my linear algebra stuff. Um, it's actually been really fun. Uh, anyway, so that's what's going on with the controls. They're still really, really primitive, um, but you basically have to have a torque-based controller instead of pure PID. Once again, this is a situation where if you have experience with this type of system or something adjacent to this maybe, and you have ideas for how you could design a controller around it, please let me know. Um, I would love to chat about it. I think about control stuff all day. So bps.space slash contact. So to cap it off here, let's talk about timeline. In the last video, which was about two months ago, I said we needed two months before we were ready to fly, or a solid two months, or something like that. Now this wouldn't be a true aerospace project unless there were delays. So I still need about another month, maybe a month and a half, before we're ready to fly this thing. Um, so the main constraints right now are finding better valves if I can, and just like beefing up the control software to get things more tightly tuned. I mean, you saw in the beginning of the video, it's not perfect. It's it's pretty close, like it'll keep the vehicle upright, but I just like to keep things a little bit more efficient in the controls code. I also need to do some roll control testing. So the pitch and yaw on the vehicle is looking pretty good, um, but I'll hang the vehicle by a string and start doing some roll control testing as well. It might be a little bit tricky because the roll axis of the vehicle has a very low mass moment of inertia, which is a very fancy way of saying it's really easy to roll the vehicle and it's a lot harder to pitch or yaw it. So we have probably overpowered thrusters on the roll control right now. Anyway, that stuff's coming up. I'll probably do another video on that. Anyway, that's about all I have for updates today. So once again, thank you to all the folks who support BPS on Patreon. The reaction control stuff specifically just would not have been possible without their generosity. Um, so things like this expensive compressor, flight hardware, valves, none of this stuff I would have felt comfortable spending money on um, without their support. So thank you to those folks. And regardless of whether you support on Patreon or not, thank you to you for watching. So my name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your wind be low.